In this lesson, we are looking at spermatogenesis and oogenesis. So this is still in the context of meiosis, but it says here that we need to compare the processes. So we need to understand their processes first. All right. So we know that the process of meiosis creates gametes, which are sex cells that are specially designed for fertilization because they have half the number of chromosomes than a normal somatic cell. In humans, that means that instead of 46 chromosomes, they'll have 23. So one of each of the homologous pairs. And these will be the sperm and the egg uh, in biologically male and female people, respectively. Now, spermatogenesis and oogenesis are the processes by which sperm and eggs are created. And yes, they absolutely involve meiosis, but these are substantially different processes. And this is due to the major differences with regard to how the biologically female and male reproductive systems work. Sperm production occurs in the seminiferous tubules um, in the male. It's a kind of a cool process where a stem cell line matures amongst a layer of other cells until a sperm cell, as we know it, is able to swim away down the lumen or the opening of the tubule to deliver it to where it needs to be. The original stem cell line, which is differentiated to become sperm later on in life, will be created in embryonic development and sit quietly and wait until puberty. So at this point, what's known as the spermatogonia, at this point, the hormone testosterone can then stimulate the cell line into maturing and specializing into sperm. So initially, the diploid cell line um, will divide over and over again, um, you know, to build up their numbers, at which point they're known as primary spermatocytes. And once they undergo their first stage of meiosis, and then they become haploid, they are known as secondary spermatocytes. They'll finish off their second meiotic division, and they're now called spermatids, and they eventually mature and differentiate into the sperm that we know. So it takes one diploid spermatocyte initially to create four haploid sperm at the end of the process. It's really quite straightforward, right? Think of it like a maturation process. In a human, we start small and immature and go through a number of different stages and eventually develop into a functioning mature organism. The same thing is happening to these cells. It just takes both mitosis and meiosis to get them to that point. Now, spermatogenesis is a continuous process. Uh, once it starts at puberty, it continues without interruption to the meiotic, sorry, mitotic or meiotic cycle. Um, and it's usually continual throughout a biologically male's life as well. Now, oogenesis, on the other hand, is not your default base level meiosis. This is a really complex process. It's got stops and starts. It's not continuous at all and has many contributing players. This is mainly happening within the ovaries. However, it will continue all the way up until the moment of fertilization, which usually occurs in the fallopian tubes. Although the basic stages of meiosis are still occurring in oogenesis, only one viable gamete is being produced at the end. The remaining cells are known as polar bodies, and they're these ones here. They do contain genetic material, but they are not usually fertilized. They usually break down. So the stem cell line which produce eggs are called oogonia, and these are all produced in the developing fetus, just like spermatogonia. At about the seven months of development embryonically, most of the oogonia die off, and the remaining cells become the primary oocytes. These are diploid. The fetus will be born with about one to two million primary oocytes per ovary, but this is all that they will receive in their entire lifetime. Okay, these primary oocytes, um, sorry, lost my place. Okay, these primary oocytes are diploid and they begin to undergo meiosis, but they will have their development paused once they reach prophase one. Right, that's not very far in. That's the first stage. So basically, they did all that DNA replication from a single to sister chromatids, but then they just sit and wait. Now, each primary oocyte will be associated with a follicle in the ovaries. Okay, and this is where it will develop individually. And as the follicles mature, so will the primary oocyte. Once puberty kicks in, the first menstrual cycle will begin. Then hormones like estrogen, progesterone, follicle stimulating hormone, and luteinizing hormone will kick in and start stimulating that follicle growth as well. At the start of the menstrual cycle, the hormones stimulate about 10, excuse me, to 20 follicles to develop. Only one is going to mature um, and remain and the rest will go into produce hormones. So that's the menstrual cycle if you, if you can remember year eight signs. Now, as one remaining follicle matures, the primary oocyte does as well and the first meiotic division completes. 
just the first. Now, usually this first meiotic division would begin with a diploid cell and produce two haploid cells. The primary oocyte does undergo, my, undergo meiosis, but when the final cytokinesis occurs, the chromosomes are evenly distributed, that's fine, but the cytoplasm is not evenly distributed, okay? One daughter cell will get almost all of the cytoplasm in that division, and the remaining cell is known as a polar body, right? So this is that end point of meiotic division one. Now, the new haploid cell with heaps of cytoplasm and the polar body are now part of the mature follicle, and at this point, the follicle will burst, and it will release it into the fallopian tubes. Um, and this is ovulation and it occurs around day 14 of the menstrual cycle. So even though the second meiotic division hasn't even happened, our haploid cell is now a secondary oocyte. Once it's been ovulated, this oocyte will hang out in the fallopian tubes traveling towards the uterus and it can last about 24 hours before it begins to break down and it won't ever complete that second division if there's no sperm to fertilize it. If there is sperm to fertilize it, however, it's at this point it will continue with meiosis. Now, once a sperm fertilizes it, it immediately finishes off that second division. And once again, we have this uneven distribution again. Okay, It's creating another polar body and it's possible for the original polar body to also undergo this division. So sometimes you will see that there are two polar bodies produced. Sometimes you will see that oogenesis produces three polar bodies. At the end of the day, we have one comparatively large giant oatid and we have three little polar bodies. So remember, all the polar bodies still have the same number of chromosomes as the ovum. So in humans, it's 23, but it's the amount of cytoplasm that is different. And the reason this happens is because zygotes, uh, there's, well, the zygote that results from the fertilization of the egg receives all of the cytoplasm. The sperm is basically a bunch of genetic materials with a tail swimming, right? So oogenesis conserves as much cytoplasm as it can through that mitotic division, sorry, meiotic division, by funneling it all into one cell, which is really kind of clever. So our final division has just been done in time for the sperm to fertilize it. And oh, sorry, the sperm will fertilize it. The second meiotic division will finish just in time for the sperm's genetic material to lock up and fuse together with that X chromosome. So when one nucleus when is created, uh, a new nuclear membrane will also be created. So you can see that here, the final division in this video happens right there, and then a new nuclear membrane will be created and those two haploid nuclei will come together and form that one diploid zygote nucleus. So at a base level, these are really similar processes, but when you look at the finer details, they are massively different. This is the diagram straight out of Pearson. And to compare the processes, which is what our subject matter says we have to do, you've got to understand the processes first, but we can break down the similarities and differences here. So both processes form haploid gametes from diploid cell lines. Both processes require the stem cell line to undergo mitosis first to boost the numbers before then proceeding with meiosis. And both processes are initiated um, by the hormones that surge during puberty. However, spermatogenesis produces four gametes from one diploid cell, whereas oogenesis is really only producing one viable gamete in three or two polar bodies. The stem cell lines which produce the gametes are different, spermatogonia versus oogonia. And importantly, oogenesis is a discontinuous process. It has stops and starts, but spermatogenesis produces gametes in one continuous development. So one tiny little point there, but quite a lot in it.